Good morning, my name is Kelsey Frazier and it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker in the Friday Lecture Series at the Center for European Studies at UNC Chapel Hill, Dr. Angelica Von Wall. Born in Germany, Dr. Von Wall received her PhD from the Free University of Berlin. She was a Fulbright student at Duke University, but she mentioned to me that her loyalties lie with the Tar Heels. <laughs> From 1996 to 2000, Dr. Von Wall was a visiting GAD professor at UNC. She was an associate professor at San Francisco State University prior to taking her current position at Lafayette College as an associate professor in the International Affairs Department. Dr. Von Wall focuses her studies on welfare state politics, labor markets, public policy, gender issues, and the politics of repar reparations primarily in Europe and the United States. Um, Professor Von Wall has numerous publications including three books and multiple articles covering a range of different social issues. Today's presentation is entitled Reconcil Reconciling Work and Family, Contradictions of Recent Policy Reforms in Germany. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Angelica Von Wall. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So welcome. I am so happy and excited to be here and to see you all. Um, before I will uh, talk about the topic today, I want to say that I'm so glad to talk to the TAM students. I've um, was around when the first TAM round started and I um, taught some students during that time so that's 12 years ago and then in the meantime I wandered and now I've, I'm, I've come back. Um, and um, one of the funny things that has just happened is that um, I was contacted um, by a former, uh, to, to, to talk to a former TAM student and invite him to participate in a research uh, project. Um, in a comparative research project and he was in that first year and that's 12 years ago and I'm back to tell you about this so <laughs> there are all kinds of places you can go uh, um, uh, on from here. So uh, I will be talking about uh, reconciling work and family contradictions of recent policy reforms in Germany and this is based uh, partly on a paper that I've presented at the European Studies, uh, at the S uh, Council of European Studies in Amsterdam this summer uh, with my co-author, uh, Annette Henninger from the University of Marburg. Um, <coughs> and you, you, you know part of the paper, um, this was one of the uh, publications um, that was sent out. So um, the first thing I want to do is to contextualize today's lecture. And um, what I want to start with is to say uh, what are we actually talking about and then I want to ask why is this interesting, right? Because we read a lot of stuff and we um, encounter a lot of publications and we wonder why would we care, right? I think it's an important question, um, the kind of so what question. Why would we want to know something about this and what is this? So what are we talking about? So. First of all, we're talking about family and work reconciliation, and I'm sure you have read a little bit about that um, already, but it's not just an issue that's an academic issue, right? But it's more of a um, public issue, right? Cheryl Sandberg with Lean In, right? Um, Anne-Marie Slaughter just um, published an article about a year and a half ago or so on why women can't have it all in the Atlantic. Um, this is the most read article in the history of the Atlantic magazine, which is really um, old. Um, so this is a large uh, a, a topic that, that people are talking about in the larger discourse, in newspapers, in all kinds of publications. <coughs> so um, then we have, beyond this kind of public discourse, we have a more academic discourse that you are becoming familiar with, which is about welfare states and uh, the changes of welfare states. And so one of the things you have probably learned in your class is that conservative welfare state, uh, states are under pressure to change and there are various areas from which this pressure comes. 
from uh, one is global capitalism and competition, international competition, and the pressure to kind of become leaner and meaner um, and more flexible. Um, and then we also have another pressure in Germany and Japan, for example, also in Italy, of low birth rates. So Germany and Italy right now have the lo lowest birth rates in um, any kind of uh, developing country, uh, developed country, I think actually globally they are, uh, have the lowest birth rates, negative birth rates, which mean, means the population is, is shrinking. Um, so what happens, so to speak, in this um, situation of pressure? We do have a number of reforms, which you've read about, and I'm going to talk about a little bit more today. Um, and those are signs that there is some kind of transition. But what kind of transition is this? Where is this reform, or are these reforms going? Right? Um, are these uh, becoming? Um, what kind of what kind of outcomes do we see? So this is a a, a presentation that talks about the reforms and their shape, the shape that they're taking. And I wrote under the structure and agency because I, I remember that as a student I found this helpful to think of the changes in welfare states as welfare states as kind of structures and institutions and uh, changes that happen as sometimes the outcome of certain kind of um, practical uh, or, 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 or behavior, let's say, of political parties through competition or political leaders. And there's this tension between the structure and agency, i.e. what people are doing and, and, and what kind of structures they are. And I think the reforms are part of that kind of tension. So, uh, contextualizing too, why is this topic important? So, um, the topic deals with interrelated issues of work, and that is paid and unpaid, with families and with power. Now, unless you are independently wealthy, you are going to work somewhere, and so you can't really get around the issue of work. Um, even if you are not employed somewhere, you're being paid, you're probably doing some unpaid work, and that is true for men and women. So this is an issue that um, I think is practically of uh, a high importance. Um, we are all parts of families and are, are uh, uh, thinking about <coughs> the issues of how to distribute work uh, within families, who has income, what kind of power dynamics come from this. So in a practical sense, this is an interesting uh, topic and an important topic for all of us. Secondly, <coughs> the welfare state literature emphasizes continuity and what, what is called path dependency, which is such a useful concept, um, where structures and institutions keep society, so to speak, in place. And you have made your way through Asping Anderson and probably some um, text by Pearson. And um, I have this old Asping Anderson copy that is, you know, kind of faded. And I have a new one that the publisher sent me, but I'm keeping the old one because it's so marked up and so my kind of heart is set on this <laughs> one. So um, this is very good stuff and I hope <coughs> that after you maybe initially were thinking, can I, can I use this in any way, that you are seeing the light on this because it's a really incredibly useful um, and, and, and powerful uh, framework. Now, when these... Um, this literature uh, emphasizes the d how, how, how uh, these welfare states have developed <coughs> and, <coughs> and how they have been kept in place. <coughs> A third um, r reason why reconciliation of work and family is important is that there are many gender-related changes that are occurring right now in family uh, and labor market policy. And that's an interesting uh, 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 topic to study. Does it matter that Germany has a high representation of female leaders? Are female leaders, as you know, there's Merkel and there are other um, female leaders in Germany. Does that matter? Is this why this is happening? Or is it just the low birth rates or global capitalism and competition? What, what are the factors that are going uh, 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 important here? And I'm focusing in this talk a little bit on the role of 
uh, uh, female leaders, but you will see other factors also play, um, play a part. So there are good reasons to care for this topic. Now, what's the situation today of women in the conservative welfare state? Lots of people are talking there's already so much change, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it looks pretty grim in many ways. So in Germany right now, uh, German women are ranked among the lowest in equal pay ranking in Europe, just before Estonia. Um, and Germany ranks 71 on the global equal pay comparison. So in terms of equal pay, uh, Germany is ranking quite low. Over a lifetime, a woman's income in Germany is about 42% of a man's. Um, Women are 60.5% of the people in the lowest income bracket, i.e. who are making less than 7.5 um, euro an hour. The percentage of women CEOs in the 200 largest German corporations uh, stand at 2.5%. As you know, Germany is very export driven, right? High skills, export driven, um, and um, it's a very important um, part of our economy, and many of these 200 largest German corporations are these kind of global, really, corporations, and there's a very, very, very low percentage of female CEOs. <coughs> Even though, as I will say later, the percentage of managers, female managers in general, is 27%. Um, uh, Women do about 75% of the housework even if both partners are employed. And single mothers have one of the highest poverty rates in Europe with about 43%. So this is um, kind of a shocking number, really. If we're thinking about the um, theories that you've learned about, about decommodification and destratification, et cetera, et cetera, what you have here is very low decommodification very high stratification, um, a trend to familiarization, right, because um, it's very hard to have an aut uh, autonomous household. If you've read um, Anne Orloff's critique of, of um, Esping Anderson's um, uh, three categories, that's one of the ones that she put in there. If single mothers have such a high poverty rate, it's very difficult to have an autonomous, maintain an autonomous household. And um, from other authors that you have encountered, you probably heard about the dualization of the uh, uh, labor market with insiders who have benefits and are well paid and outsiders, right? Women often are outsiders in these labor markets. Not, not all of them, but there is definitely a higher percentage uh, there. So this is the situation um, right now. Now there are, um, in the last years, four uh, major reforms have happened. And I, uh, I'm wondering where do the changes in the conservative welfare regime originate in regards to family and labor market policy? Where, so where do these changes come from that we're going to encounter and that you, you've read about? Now several authors, and many more than I've put up there, have argued this is electoral competition. Um, and what has happened is that historically parties had a really good control in a sense over their voters. Just like in the United States, you see however, that there are these independent voters now, right? And there is what we call de-alignment and the party is always trying to appeal to this independent voters, right? We wanna get them all on board because those conservatives and those re Republicans are not really so reliable anymore, right? So you have to speak to them and you have to speak to them with policy with um, issues that they will find appealing so that they come and vote and that they vote for you, right? And what has happened is that historically women voted in large numbers for the conservative parties. That sounds maybe odd. This is not the case now here, but um, this is, has been for a long time the case in Germany. And in the 70s that changed and women started to uh, vote for the Social Democrats and the, and the Liberal parties. So um, suddenly there was electoral competition over 
female voters. Female wo voters were suddenly kind of on the table as a group to, to get to your side. And since you know we're half the population, that's a big part of the pie. So you want right, them on your side. Um, so one of the things that happened is that parties developed quotas. And this is really important to understand because it's an important difference to the United States. When we talk about quotas, right, everybody kind of shudders, right? Quotas are bad word that's like, you know, these, these words that we just usually just have a letter, and this could be like the Q word. Um, and um, interestingly in Germany, right, quotas are voluntary. So it's very important to understand. And they are um, introduced by the parties themselves. So in 1982, the Green Party, or right, the kind of environmentalist kind of young party, said we should have half of our, our uh, parliamentarians should be women. And that was totally just radical and mind-blowing. Um, and um, one of the, <laughs> the, the things that happened was that women said, oh, that's kind of cool. We want to vote for them. And they started to vote for the Greens. And the Greens grew in size, and you can imagine maybe what then happened, because if you have a situation of competition, what's the, what's the, what's the effect of that if your strategy is successful? Other parties copied it? Yes, other parties copy it, right? Other parties are saying, oh my god, right? We have to go along with this. So you have shortly after the Social Democrats, so shortly after, actually, the parties on the Christian Democratic right are copying it. Now, five out of six parties have voluntary quotas. So there's a competition for the vote, and that means more women have come into the parties. And that is also where we have now in Germany, which is right part of the conservative welfare state regime, a third of the parliamentarians are women. So there's a conservative regime but actually a pretty high percentage of, of women in politics and in powerful positions. As you know, the chancellor, right, now re-elected for the third time, right, is a woman. So they have all, to some extent, also profited from the attempt of the parties to open up and to get more female voters to vote for them. And as you saw in the last election, that is probably extremely successful for Merkel, who's had, you know, a, 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 a blowout, right, in terms of the, the votes. Does female leadership improve substantive, uh, substantive uh, representation of, of women, such as income, access to jobs, and work-life balance? So here I'm asking, so does this matter now? Are they, are they going to do something that helps women, or what are they, what are they doing? I mean, they are representing a lot of interests. They're representing their party, they're representing um, their constituency in a district, um, they are having a lot of different overlapping identities, right? They're not going into the election as women, they're going into the election as maybe Protestants or Catholics or um, part of a number of different um, um, groups that they are representing. So we're looking at four policies to test if substantive interests of women have um, been realized. And the first ones are um, parental leave and care allowance in the area of family policy, and the second ones are two policies in the labor market. So we'll see um, what um, comes of it. Uh, just quickly as a Summary, my research question is, does the increased descriptive representation of women in the highest level of government lead to substantive representation of women's interests? And there are several hypotheses. Um, yes, female leaders support women's substantive interests, but they do so selectively. So yes, they do support them, but not all of them. And what is the partiality here? And I think what we might be seeing is that the interests of the poor or unemployed or migrant women continue to be neglected or are actually even uh, are losing out more. Um, 
On the other hand, the conservative welfare state and the labor market includes some women in the core more so than before, but excludes others. Okay. Women's interests. Women's interests are really a problem. There are two problems. One problem is women, and the <laughs> other problem is interest. <laughs> so um, the first one is really kind of a joke. Sigmund Freud said, you know, what does a woman want, right? Um, it, 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 you know, you can't figure it out. He worked 30 years in psych psychoanalysis and didn't know what they wanted. Um, what I want to say here is that the category of what a woman is has um, has, there's a big debate about um, what women are, if they are socially constructed, is this a biological category, is this a social category, is this performance, um, and what interests are. And um, historically Marxists and Marxist feminists have defined interests kind of a priori, i.e. let's say if you are poor you would want to be better off, right? It's kind of a no-brainer in some way. However, this has been um, criticized by a number of, of authors over the years who have said interests are not just material, they're also culturally determined, and so culture has to kind of be part of how we understand what interests are. Liberal feminism has said, well, the interests of women are kind of clear, that's equal, equal rights, Right, and that's very much the dominant discourse in the United States. However, that approach was <coughs> criticized, especially by African American um, uh, scholars like uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who uh, coined the term intersectionality. And if you go to Google and look for um, her name, this term and this article has been cited like 3,000 times. Um, and she basically said um, that many of the goals of American feminism are um, implicitly focused on the interest of white and middle class women. And that <coughs> if you were taking race into account or, 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 or lower class interests, that the interests would shift, they would be different. Um, and this is an important part of what I will talk about um, as we move ahead. And then there are post-structural theories where um, the concept of women is considered essentialist and, and uh, doesn't really exist in that sense. And recent constructivist feminist theories that say, we can really not say in advance what women's interest is, we can only see it afterwards um, and see what kind of claims have been made. What did my uh, co-author and I make out of this? We are proposing that yes, Women as collective actors are socially constructed. Uh, this construction is embedded in intersectional power differentials, difference of interest, and also national discourse. That means in Germany it would look different than in the United States. The criterion for the assessment of the quality of a policy is women's empowerment. So are women empowered by a policy? We would say yes, then this is in women's interest if their standing, uh, social or economic or political is diminished, then we would say it's not in women's interest. So there's a kind of a two-stage model, minimal interests that are kind of obvious, like physical and viability, and then other claims are more constructive. So we are looking at these reforms um, in a second <coughs> political agenda, who promoted it, what kind of conflicts were in there, what are the political positions of the three female leaders, what interests are being expressed in these reforms, and what are the conceivable destratification and defamiliarization effects. Okay, first reform. Now you remember, of course, Esping Adams. How can you forget it? And the three welfare state regimes, and in these, uh, in this, uh, uh, his, um, studies, right, um, the social democratic um, welfare state regime has a kind of dual earner, dual carer model, right, while the conservative welfare state regime has a, um, has a breadwinner model. Well, if you just look at the dark blue area for a moment, 
So since 2007, since um, um, Mackel and uh, von der Leyen and uh, uh, those two have been, so to speak, around, uh, Mackel, obviously the Chancellor, von der Leyen, um, the, the Ministry of Family, uh, they have introduced a parental leave benefit. And this parental leave benefit is basically modeled on a Scandinavian approach. This is a big deal. This is a really important shift. So if we're thinking of our welfare states shifting, on that front, we are shifting. So until that time, if a woman was staying at home, she would receive 300 um, euros uh, a month um, for up to two years. Now let's say you are an employed a woman and you are making maybe 2,000 euros and your choice is to stay at home with a child and make 300, get 300 euros or to continue to work. You might be thinking I rather continue working because 300 euros has very little money, right? And so even, and especially women who were making a little bit more, were saying, um, this is not for me, and one of, probably one of the reasons why we have such a low birth rate. So the low birth rate, um, actually, conservative countries have lower birth <coughs> rates today <coughs> than Nordic Protestant countries. So it's a really interesting switch around. Now we have a Scandinavian model, in a sense, not, not as generous, but in the same vein, where um, if you are taking this time off for parental leave, you're getting 67% of your net income, which if you get 2,000, let's say you make 2,000 euros, will be right much more, will be about 1,300 and a little bit instead of 300. So this is much more appealing for, um, for um, employed women. Um, in addition, there's something called the Daddy Month. Has anybody heard about the Daddy Month? Okay, so if we're thinking about changing, so to speak, how society thinks about the roles of mothers and fathers, historically in Germany, the fathers were going to work, the mothers stayed at home. Now there's this really interesting policy that is saying we want the fathers to be involved in caring for their children. And we will reserve two months where basically only the fathers can take these two months. If they don't take it, the money will be gone, the time off will be gone. If they want to take it, they can. And um, they have introduced that and it's been really quite a success. It's very interesting because a lot of younger men want to be very involved fathers and so they have taken advantage of this new policy. So this was originally already a reform project of the left and green government, um, but it seemed kind of outrageous and a little bit too drastic of a change. In the um, grand coalition that followed where the Christian Democrats were ruling together with the SPD, um, they took this on as like a new course uh, together and said that Germany needs to modernize, Germany needs to address the issue of low birth rate, uh, more women need to be employed, um, and female voters want this, and um, it was passed. Now what's the stratification effect on the bottom? It expands the circle of uh, beneficiaries among the middle class, and it's much better deal among the middle class than it would be um, um, in comparison to the policy before. However, the welfare recipients are actually excluded. So they do not receive a higher um, uh, transfer payment. And we do have an effect also have uh, defamiliarization, i.e. we have um, a, 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 an effect that would make it easier um, for men to be involved um, and also a little bit easier um, for women to um, stay um, employed. 
Any any question right now about this one? This is the first one. Okay. The second policy is a so-called care allowance, which just started in August. It's another one of the <coughs> packages of reforms. And it's been a very heated debate to get this one passed. It supports parents who care for their um, children at home. These, these children, ha basically, if you think of 12 months of the parental leave, plus two months, daddy month, or 14 months, and at the 15th month, these toddlers, if your mother wants to stay at home, the mothers receive 100 to 100, um, 100 um, euros a month right now, 150 down the road. It doesn't strike you probably as a very progressive policy or very generous. It's a very odd um, uh, a policy that passed, um, and we can talk more about it later. So this was uh, uh, promoted by the Christian Social Union, so the Bavarian kind of wing of the Christian Democratic Party, which is uh, considered the most conservative. The central conflicts um, there are between, on one hand, upholding the traditional male breadwinner model, male breadwinner model mm -hmm. which this one is supposed to do, supported by the Bavarian um, Conservative Party, <coughs> against all of this modernization and all these changes uh, against the opposition parties. Interestingly enough, women of all parties, also women in the conservative and Christian democratic parties and public opinion have spoken out against this reform. Um, <coughs> it's really a political feat that a small party like this has been able to push down a reform that had everybody <laughs> against it. Um, this um, supports the middle class um, welfare recipients against, uh, again, are uh, excluded. Um, and it's really a form of refamiliarization. So it does kind of the opposite of what the other policy does. Um, and the support here is mixed. Merkel was for it. Uh, von der Leyen, who was the family minister, was against it. She said, it would be a, uh, a catastrophe. Um, and Schroeder, um, uh, another female minister who later became the family minister, said, yes, we support this. These women are all from the same political part, but they have an incredible fight over this policy. Um, and this has been passed um, in a larger kind of trade-off between reforms. All right, so this is, these are the two reforms in the family policy. Now gender quotas. I put up this map. I don't know if this has a little light. Yes. In the, this red. Uh -huh. Cool. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so here you see Sweden, Denmark, Finland, they do really well on these gender quotas. And these gender quotas, there are three kinds. The orange is women in leadership position in publicly traded companies in the highest management uh, body. Um, national governments, uh, so that's the purple, and here, you know, Finland is over a half, Sweden is at 46, and in national parliaments. So, uh, also, Finland and Sweden are ahead, but basically nearly even. Germany here um, has 38% uh, um, in the national governments, 32 in the parliament. As I said, it's about a third. That's because of these voluntary quotas I talked about, but very low still, as many other countries, on these representation in publicly traded companies or in other companies. As I said, the percentage of women um, CEOs in the largest 200 corporations is only 2.5 percent. So we do have an expanding representation of women in politics, but not a very good representation of women in corporations. Now you could say that's not really an issue because, and I understand that point, political representation is a different beast than people being part of 
profit-making institutions? Why should there be certain groups represented? Norway, which is funny because it's not on here, is the country that went ahead in 2005 and said, we want a quota also for these positions, for these orange positions. We also think there should be a quota there, and they put forward a 40% quota. <coughs> that made businesses in Europe really very uh, worried. Who knows what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> Um, and um, France uh, passed a quota, a 40% quota that will come into full um, effect in 2017 uh, for businesses with more than 500 employees. Spain has passed one. You see Spain is only at 10%. So they have all passed these. And so a debate also started in Germany. Should Germany have uh, a quota like this? And that is the third reform that I want to uh, uh, talk about with you. So the question about flexible quotas, um, and they are indeed planned for now, and the CDU, after a very, very bitter fight, has said, okay, it promises to start them in 2020. <coughs> the progressive wing of the CDU, again, was for this. Uh, while the opposing party, the Greens, the SPD, um, um, a, 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 what was also supporting this um, recent kind of new idea. And the central conflict here is between the labor wing and women in the CDU versus the business community, the conservative wing of the CDU, and the more <coughs> neoliberal parties that really want uh, kind of the lean and mean economy and not some kind of social engineering in, in their businesses. Here we had a very vocal fight among these three uh, ladies. Um, Merkel saying, no, 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 we can't have this quota. Uh, we are depending on our export industry. We are depending that Germany is kind of pulling its weight in this euro crisis. We're not going to have some uh, experiments like this. Von der Leyen again said, oh, we should have a 30% quota. And Schröder um, first said <laughs> she wouldn't even talk about the issue. But then that got a little uncomfortable because a lot of voters were really upset because she's the Ministry for Family and Women. And she says, oh, I'm not going to talk about that. So she got a lot of um, bad press. There was actually a web page that um, quickly had over 25,000 signatories that was called Nicht meine Ministerin, not my minister, where people could sign in who were mad with her and say, you know, she was, she was so disliked that, that, that people had kind of a, a little bit of a public um, uh, kind of petition, so to speak, against her. Um, the stratification effects of this reform are that it supports the aspirations of highly educated, high-income women. So it's a kind of a form of affirmative action opening access to very high level, very high income jobs. Obviously, just for a very small strata of women and men, right? This is, these are kind of more exclusive jobs. Um, but they will, in a sense, open the doors um, for uh, some of them. And now comes the last uh, reform. That's the opposite end of the income uh, scale, minimum wage. Now, Germany is one of the seven European countries, you will maybe be surprised to find, that has no minimum wage. And it has no minimum wage, if you think of um, Scandinavian countries, they also have no minimum wage. Um, historically because the unions were so strong and all-encompassing that you didn't really have to have this kind of bottom emergency break because people were generally better off. As the unions are weakening in Germany and we have a really exploding low-wage uh, uh, sector, many women are suddenly um, 
vo uh, working in, in parts of the economy where they are, you could consider them basically as working poor, which is a new kind of concept. So the EU data shows that the German low wage sector is growing rapidly and there are only two countries in all of Europe that have a bigger low wage sector for women and that's Latvia and Lithuania. Now Germany is really wealthy, that is pretty extreme. Um, and in 2010, 30%, 30.8 to be specific, of all um, gainfully employed women um, earned wages below 60% of the median income, so a third of them. And um, uh, of the people who were um, earning uh, much, l much less, basically, than kind of the median, 60% um, uh, of those low-wage workers are women. So in a sense, it is obviously a pro problem for men and women, but there are more women in this area. However, what we find is that there's not a big interest among women in this topic, even though it affects a lot of women. There's no or hardly any political organization for them, and they're, they're not really represented by the unions because these jobs are very marginal. Um, so women's organizations pick this up, but they're really rather weak. Um, the labor unions have started to pick this up, this topic, very recently, and the labor wing of the Christian Democratic Union and the opposition parties. Um, the business community and the, the liberal, um, neoliberal parties uh, are against it, and I just read today in the German newspaper on the web that um, the um, business wing of the Christian Democrats are really pushing against that. They don't want a minimum wage um, to happen. Merkel um, thinks that yes, there should be one. Von der Leyen uh, thinks there should be one. And, and Schröder, in the meantime, has stepped down. And it is kind of unclear. But she's never, even on her web page, had any information on this. So we, we assume that she probably was not very interested. So. Stratification effects, is this going to help empower women? Is it in the interest or, or, or what? Um, a universal minimum wage would reduce stratification, right? That would be good to lift, so to speak, the bottom uh, up. Um, but what it looks like, what's going to happen is that there will be a flexible win minimum wage um, according to sector or occupations. And I'll show you how this looks like. Um, I apologize, this is in German, the, 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 the occupations. Um, so these are different occupations, and these are the minimum wages, and you see that they are really different. So if you are working in, um, in construction, your minimum wage is in uh, the old area of West Germany, um, 1350, and in the uh, former East German uh, lender is uh, three euros less. It's, so it's relatively high. Well, if you go to laundry services, right, it's seven and eight. So it's not a universal minimum wage, but it's kind of staggered. And now guess where women are at, right? If you look at those jobs, oh, excuse me, um, uh, laundry service and care, which would be the two where women would be in here. These are uh, you know, mining or roofers or electronics, etc. These would be the two, and this, these are both on the very low end. So um, the impact will probably be uh, less than maybe what people are hoping. Here are some of the lowest wages in selected female occupations. Hairdresser per hour, 275. So for Europe, this is just mind-blowingly um, low. Florist, 435. Call center agent, 511. Doctor's assistant, a white-collar job, 
um, six euro forty three. So as a monthly income, this is uh, you know this is this is very little to to to, to live off for for anybody. Conclusion. You've been waiting for that. What are we finding out now? Reforming the conservative welfare state. So if we go back to family policy, we had the parental leave benefit, right, which affected kind of a defamiliarization, right? Women were able, well, were probably going to be able to keep on working. Um, men are brought more into the family. Um, the care allowance was a policy, looks like a policy that's doing kind of the opposite, refamiliarization. So overall, these policies I would characterize as contradictory. They seem to kind of not exactly fit with each other. On the labor market, it's interesting because here we have the quotas for the high-flying kind of managers, um, which is a form of affirmative action. And then we have a minimum wage. This is kind of the bottom, so to speak, in terms of income. This would be uh, de-stratifying. So we have classified these as complementary. They, they speak to different groups of women, but they seem to kind of fit with each other, i.e. get access to the top, but also help women who have really, really low paying jobs. Is the conservative welfare state withering away? Why or why not? So recent reforms in the welfare state point to path shifting. You saw that article by Kimberly Morgan, beautiful, beautiful article, really extremely well written. Um, and they occur in part through the growing representation of women. Female political leaders <coughs> do represent substantive, substantive interests of women that go against uh, the traditional male breadwinner model. So do, make, do female leaders make a difference? Yes, it looks that they, they might. That's not the only thing that's happening. Right, global competition, low birth rates, but somebody has to have this agency. Somebody has to also carry this forward, and I think they they do carry this uh, these demands and these interests forward. However, three out of the four recent reforms have the tendency to leave poor women and women with low skills, which are, well, often migrants. Um, without the reform benefits. Remember, welfare state recipients were excluded from various reforms. So if you're poor, well, there's all these great reforms, but you are maybe not going to be benefiting from them. And the third point that has uh, flummoxed us a little bit is that um, one reform claims to be in the interest of women but is reintroducing a male Brenner model. This is the care allowance. So it says, yes, this is in, oops, this is in, the, is in the interest of women, but we're not so sure if we think that empowerment um, defines women's interests. And then there's another um, policy that makes no claims about women, and that's the minimum wage one. Nobody's talking about women. It's about the working class, which is possibly the reason why it maybe could be successful, honestly. <laughs> you have to frame the issue differently. If it's about women, it's like, well, you know. But if it's about the working class, maybe we have a shot at it. And so that would be um, a, a policy, I think, that would be important in terms of de-stratification. This leaves us with uh, substantive, the substantive representation of the interests of poor working class, low-skilled, and migrant women in the conservative welfare state is still bleak, um, but middle class women are increasingly becoming insiders. So the conservative welfare state is being redefined, I think, but underlying structures and interests are still present and they're not going to you know, wither away very um, easily. Thank you very much. So are there any questions, comments? Yes? I have a question about the category of women between the middle class and the sort of the bottom class, the migrants, the unemployed, the welfare recipients. Yeah. What about women in the who are the working poor? Do they participate more differentially in the first two benefits? The child uh, the um, 
leave policy, da mommy and daddy leave policy and the care? C can you disaggregate the middle class from the working poor? Yeah, um, as long as they don't receive Hartz II, this uh, uh, uh -huh. welfare or, or um, which was in the past unemployment, but is now uh, recast, mm -hmm. if they receive that, then they will not be eligible. Or they will be, in a sense, they might receive something, but it would be taken off right. their welfare funds. So right. they are not right. adding right. anything to what they are receiving. Um, it's, it's a pretty clear cutoff point. Anybody basically on welfare is, um, is excluded from, from, from that. So it's, it, yeah. And so everybody else is sort of middle class. Yeah. It's a broad definition. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Actually, in response to the financial crisis, uh, the parental leave for uh, couples who earn more than 500,000 euros, <laughs> they, they are not also at now. Oh, that's some justice. They don't really need 1,000 bucks a month. <laughs> 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 it's not really. Yeah, so, so, so on a very high end. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking comparatively here. Could, yes. you, could you comment on the difference between the U.S. and Germany? Because I know that we don't have very strong, uh, I guess you'd say, maternity leave or care allowance p policies here, but I feel like our birth rate is probably higher. But mm -hmm. could you comment on the difference between that? That is an excellent, <coughs> excellent question <laughs> and a really interesting question, and I've wondered about this as, as have others. So. Historically, I would say, European countries in the process of nation building have started to keep track of their population. Who are these people that we're ruling? <laughs> um, how many are there? How healthy are they? Where do they live? What do they know? Um, and over the 19th century developed an idea that there should be the sh population should be growing, kind of in a competition among nations, so to speak, over, over power, basically. And France and other nations have developed these policies that have helped families to, um, to, 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 to expand, to, to, to keep together and also to expand. And Germany also over the um, last 100 years has tried to, um, to support families, or actually longer than 100 years. The United States has a very different history in terms of nation building. And one of the great aspects of the United States is that it is comparatively much more open. And so to be a German citizen, as you have maybe heard from another class, you have to, until very recently, have German parents. Now, if you come from another country um, and you are immigrating, like what many people came from Turkey and other northern, Af northern African states, southern European states, um, they have been citizens without, they have, they have not been citizens, they have been people without voting rights and certain political citizenship rights. And the United States, in contrast, has been a country that has welcomed people where you could become a citizen according to your beliefs. If you bought into the American Constitution and the American dream, you can become a citizen. That means you are able to grow your population by just opening the door and say, do you, would you like to come to the United States? And there will be sh arms shooting up all over the globe and say, oh, this would be good. The Germans and the French have been very reluctant <laughs> with that door because their definition, although the French would disagree with me here vehemently, but the Germans <laughs> definitely and the Austrians and some others would say, you're not really German. You can't just come here and say you're German. That's not the German population that we are thinking of when we think of Germans. We think of people like us. So there's this idea of bloodlines that kind of runs, so to speak, from one generation to another. So European states historically have been more concerned with birth rates and growing their population. And the United States, I think, as an immigrant country and a country that has been, for the most part of its history, rural and has had large families and has been wealthy and has not been seeing wars on its 
on its territory has not had the same kind of concern dash obsession that you find in <coughs> family. I think it's a great question. Why do we even have family policy? What is that, right? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, concerns? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I wanted to ask about the care allowance policy mm -hmm. um, in terms of its actual effect rather than the philosophy behind the policy. Yeah. You mentioned that it reinforces the male breadwinner model, which is of course true, but you also mentioned that it's such a small amount. And where the, when we looked at the previous uh, family leave policy, where the 300 euros a month weren't enough to keep women home, why would 100 euros a month Mm -hmm. keep women home and is this more a policy for publicity than something that will have an actual impact on the decisions that women make? That's an, another excellent question. We of course don't know yet exactly what the outcome would be because it started in August. Mm -hmm. So we, we will see who, 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 who will, uh, what kind of take up these policies have. But we do have some international examples. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, several of the uh, Scandinavian countries have passed something like the care allowance. Finland, I think, in the mid 80s, and then Sweden after a big fight. And um, so they do have a policy like that. And then one state in Germany, in former East Germany, Thuringen, also introduced this kind of care allowance before the federal um, uh, uh, introduction, which means that we do have some ideas of what the effects are. So some of the effects seem to be women are possibly staying more at home and not working, which should be obviously their choice, what they want to do. Um, it seems that it has led to a higher um, percentage, of, uh, a larger percentage of migrant women are taking the, uh, the care allowance and then native women. Um, and it seems that it might be a problem that the children of immigrant um, families who should be able to, um, uh, or, 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 or need to learn the language of their new country quicker, right, and be, so to speak, on par with other people in their, in their schools, with other children in their schools, are maybe um, hurt um, by staying at home for, you know, maybe for, for three, four, five years and not enter kindergarten. Because you can see that um, the ability to speak the native language is often lower. And so one of the ideas was if you get children into childcare earlier, so the parental leave policy, um, is actually flanked in Germany by another law that I left out, which is very um, dramatic, which gives families a legal right to a spot for the child in childcare after the fi uh, 15th month. That is really very, um, very revolutionary in a sense. So, um, to come back to your question, studies in other countries have shown that possibly women will drop out more from the workforce and it might hurt the children of not only migrant but also working class poor who have maybe not the same access to educational material, books, people reading to them, etc., etc. So it might have some not so, you know, positive effects. We don't know exactly yet. Do you think that the minimum wage laws could counter those effects by increasing the opportunity cost of staying home? Yeah, that's, we, it depends a little bit how minimum the minimum wage is. Yeah. At the moment it's really very low, um, but you know, as it goes up, um, it might change. It does, on the other hand, you know, to, 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 to play devil's advocate, Let's say you are um, living in a rural area in southern Germany, and there is really no um, professional childcare nearby, um, and you are you are um, having maybe you're working maybe in one of these really poorly paid jobs. 
Well, you're saying maybe, why wouldn't I stay at home, right? So it, it potentially also gives some women choices. However, the women that have better choices are middle class women, because then it's not, right, this brutal trade off um, and that I think poorer women would face. Yes? So my question kind of piggybacks on that and has to do with um, the, um, this idea that every child at 15 months is, gets a spot. Mm -hmm. not but that's still not a publicly funded spot, right? I mean, it's not publicly f funded daycare. Yes, it is. It is. It is. So, it so, is. so that's very one clarification. Expensive. Right. So that's one question. That is very, then, of course, very revolutionary, more Scandinavian-like yes. than what in the past. But then antidotally, German in, Germans that I know are saying that there's a tremendous shortage. They, get, they guarantee yes. that, but there aren't the spots. Yes. So, um, and again, coming back to your rural example, you know, those spots um, might be more, you know, prevalent in, in certain areas of Germany or in certain lander than in others. Yes. And, and That's not really a question, but. Germany, which shows, shows that East Germany has much better coverage in terms of the availability <laughs> of early child care, um, um, uh, and, and in the West it's much lower. You are absolutely right. So historically, Germany has very much lagged behind um, child care for the really young. And under Merkel, and especially von der Leyen, um, Basically, the idea was, I think, to expand to some extent what Scandinavian countries have and also what former East Germany had, which, of course, you couldn't say. <laughs> <laughs> Just not an acceptable uh, 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 way forward, but I think, indeed, this is kind of what is uh, happening. The costs for childcare, buildings, infrastructure, training is huge. Who carries the cost historically of uh, the municipalities and the, the federal and the states? So they say, well, what you're thinking of in Berlin, maybe that sounds good if you're competing for women's votes, but we gotta pay for this? How are we gonna pay for this? And in many occasions the states are trying to show that they will be, you know, strong and will resent any impositions from the central government. Mm -hmm although they have much less power of course than American states, it's, it's a little bit of a um, smoke screen. But in this situation, they said, really, we don't have the money for this, for these grand plans. Um, and the federal government said, we can actually give you the money to build these buildings. Would you take the money? Oh, this is like Obamacare. <laughs> <laughs> Would you take the money or not? So, so, so they took the money, they took the money, and um, then now they have to staff these buildings, right? And of course, suddenly the mothers were saying, okay, until recently I thought I would stay at home with the kids, but now there's childcare. Now I can actually, you know, go out and, and uh, you know, uh, find a job. And the employment rate of women in Germany is really high. I think it's right now the highest it has ever been. So I'm not saying that that's an effect of this policy because it's really too new, but, um, the tax coffers are full, the pensions will be paid, uh, you know, it, it might be a good investment um, to, to invest in children, not only in terms of human capital, but also to have mothers therefore be free to be employed. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a policy that, um, the parental leave kind of goes hand in hand with another one that I didn't talk about. But the betroying care, the care allowance was perceived as kind of a, a, a pushback um, against, against this. Yeah. Because it's, it is very low, you know. I mean, 100 euros a month, what are you gonna do with that? Yes. No, that, 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 oh, okay, pass it on. 
my question was about quotas, uh, yeah. keyword. Um, you said that for, for parties, they self-imposed quotas, and it was uh, an effective way of winning uh, female voters. Yeah. But in terms of CEO quotas, uh, how would a policy like that be reinforced or incentivized? Well, that's a terribly good question. <laughs> 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 incentivized. Um, so part of the an older discourse I think about opening kind of doors for women or minorities was about fairness right and uh, a justice and, and social justice issues that's not a very effective s frame in today's world so you can say you know no no none of the big governments are saying uh, or big corporations are saying we're doing this because because we want to be better people and you know we feel strongly about no they all say that it's better business. And there are a number of studies that show if you have more diverse um, leadership in terms of race, in terms of gender, these businesses actually are doing better because you are trying to sell to uh, usually a diverse population, especially if you're a global company. So you might be more profitable if you have more women. And there are studies that show that businesses that have more women leaders, not more than men, but more than 2.5%, <laughs> are actually doing better. So that would be the incentive in terms of profit. But in the business community, this is not a very convincing argument. <laughs> uh, because they've been pretty profitable so far. Um, and it imposes new rules, it might not allow for the flexibility that they want, um, they would have to explain themselves towards the government. Um, this is not voluntary. This is, this is a different kind of um, approach because there would be a law that would say, you know, you have to have a certain percentage of women CEOs. While the political parties have just said, we want to do that. We want to have this quota so that you know we hear different voices from our uh, populace, but also we will ha attract voters. So one is voluntary, one is um, possibly a law. Um, on the other hand, the Social Democrats and the Greens had an agreement in 2001, when, when so the left government was in power, and they had a agreement with the representatives of the employers associations in 2001 that said in the next 10 years they will increase the numbers of women in higher paying jobs managerial jobs and kind of on the on the on the upper uppest level and they did nothing they did nothing at all and because that i think um, happened there was not a lot of defense, even from some conservatives who said, well, you said you would, and you didn't do anything. Actually, even the numbers went down a little bit. So they didn't come up to what they had promised themselves. And 2.5%, that's, that's hard to argue with. So I think there's a certain sense of something should happen, but how that should happen is really, um, it's really challenging. The telecom, the largest, you know, um, communications phone provider has now instituted a voluntary for themselves 30 percent quota they're not there yet but they said okay we're going to go forward with that I think Daimler Benz is, has thinks of a 12 percent quota and then some other companies BMW I don't know 10 or something like that so um, the more conservative wing in the Christian Democratic Union has said okay, we should do something, but the employer should set the quota themselves. They should set, they should say what the quota should be, not, they shouldn't come from above kind of a general quota for all the different areas um, and, and sectors. And if that works, you know, we don't know, I'm sure that would lead possibly to something similar, kind of a mirror image of the minimum wage i.e. if you have a business that sells tractors, um, probably the business would say, well, this is probably not going to be very attractive for female employees, and 
they don't know anything about tractors anyway. Um, so maybe their voluntary quota would be, you know, 5%. But if you were selling um, clothes, you know, maybe you would want to have um, a, a higher voluntary quota. I think if there's no legal one, it will be very uneven, and I think that's what we're going to see in the next years. But it might be even a still a little bit more than what we have right now. So it's that's going to be a big fight, though. That's going to th 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 there's not a lot of uh, agreement on that one, even among women. Yes. Um, you've spoken a lot about enabling women to enter the workforce, mm -hmm. and while I kind of have two questions, one being, are there positions for them to take? Is this something where there's actual jobs that are pre-existing for them to have? And B, I guess, um, kind of these companies instituting quotas, mm -hmm. what effect does that have? Does that then drive out males out of their work? and such, or are they creating new jobs? Um, I guess just kind of what effect does that lead to down the road? Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, so at the moment, uh, the percentage is, is very low, and uh, one of the arguments uh, that has been made, and I read uh, some articles about this, is where does this leave male employees if they want to, they're also competing for these jobs, right? Uh, is this fair to them? And I think that's a question generally that we find a lot with quotas, and that's I think why it's that Q word, right? Because because there's a trade-off, right? Um, unlike with the political parties, where everybody can be a voter, right? And uh, 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 not everybody can be a parliamentarian. There was a similar debate there, but it's not about profitability or something like that. So in a business. Uh, right, you want to get the people who are best qualified to run your, your business and, and, and make profit. And the argument from, I think, uh, supporters of the quota would have been, how come that 97.5 of women are so not qualified? You know, if we switch it around, how can that be? Are really the most qualified gaining access? So I think I think the, the, the idea is to if you open the doors, um, maybe in terms of quality, it would have a, a, a positive um, effect. Are there um, jobs for women? This is a really good question. As in the United States, you know the, the sociologists have come up with this um, kind of a, 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 a collection, so to speak, of all the jobs that exist, and there are hundreds of them, and. Women show up in a very small group of jobs. Um, if you look at uh, positions where they are dominant. So you all know where you will expect a woman when you open the door and you think, is this gonna be a man or a woman in this occupation, right? A nurse or an elementary school teacher, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? Will very high, likely be women. Uh, so there are a lot of these jobs, and there are a lot of lower paid jobs, um, but there are also, of course, professional jobs that women can enter to. Uh, with the expansion of um, higher education in Germany in the 70s, right, you have an expansion in terms of women being in medicine, and law, and um, technology, um, natural sciences, so you do have an, a, a dramatic expansion. The choices, so in education, but the choices then of jobs that women take are much more limited than I think what they have actually acquired in terms of their education. And that would be, I think, similar to here, um, where we have, you know, kind of a typically typical women's jobs, right, um, where the majority of women are in these jobs. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yes. You are asking great questions. This is going to, you know, stay with me, and I would think about them, and then I would try to find even better answers to what I'm saying. I was wondering uh, when you were talking about female leadership, it seems almost as if really these women friendly policies 
aren't so much driven by female leadership as by von der Leyen's leadership. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, Schröder has been either opposed or inarticulate on all of the mm -hmm. women-friendly policies that you've identified. Mm -hmm. um, Merkel has nodded to a couple of them, but she hasn't initiated any of them, mm -hmm. and she's been reluctant on some of them. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like it's really von der Leyen. Um, so is this uh, more a case of an individual politician, um, or can we make broader conclusions about female leadership? Um, I mean, is there maybe even an argument to be made that uh, female leaders can be harmful to mm -hmm. women-friendly policies? Uh, I mean, it seems like oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, Merkel, especially at the beginning, was like very carefully silent on mm -hmm. women and, friend and, and families uh, because she didn't want to be seen as um, the woman. And uh, Schröder has profiled herself as a very conservative woman, she calls herself an anti-feminist. Mm -hmm. um, just and uh, similarly with uh, Merkel's vice chancellors, one of them has been a gay man, the other one has been a member of an ethnic minority, yet mm -hmm. Merkel's governments have done next to nothing mm -hmm. for either of these groups. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. so, so does, does, the, um, does female leadership in general matter? Is this maybe just one person who is like a one person show? So just to give you a, a, a free sentence background on von der Leyen, who's a really interesting character. She is the daughter of a former governor, a very successful governor. She is the mother of seven children. Uh, she has a medical degree, and she has a public policy degree from Stanford. <laughs> and she's not taken any anything. So she has decided, basically, Germany needs to change. And, and so it is very much her, so to speak, in that position that is pushing. When you say um, Merkel is not, um, Merkel is just nodding, you said, or something, right? I think that is really important. She's not quietly shaking her head. She is <laughs> quietly nodding. <laughs> she is saying, I can't say this out loud um, because I have to represent everybody. Right? And I am not going to put myself out there on policies that um, will look maybe like special interest. But I will try to not put too many stones in the way of, of this reform going forward. And I think in con contrast to earlier governments that were maybe more left, and where you would have expected maybe more reform, there was neither this engaged kind of motor who was pulling things forward, nor was there a quiet kind of level of support to say, we we'll let this, we, we'll, we'll check this out, we we'll let this go forward and see how much pushback we're getting. And when the parental leave policy was going forward, people were not really protesting, not even conservatives. The daddy month was a little bit iffy for the conservatives. It's <laughs> like, what are you trying to do to our men? <laughs> but but uh, even that was, you know, is this voluntary, you know? Um, so I think it's a very good question that you're asking. Are we, are we able to make generalizations? Or is this just a fluke? Are these just some female leaders who are changing, uh, uh, reforming, the welfare state, and if there were other women, nothing would happen, right? This is not not uh, not an easy question to answer. Um, or is that general generalizable trend more more descriptive representation in parliament of women? A third of the representatives are women, and we have kind of a switch to substantive representation. Now, these interests are being aired more, and the representatives are women. So. Um, I do think it's not just a story about those, those three women. I do think it is a larger, larger story, but I do think it matters that they are women and uh, that they have some, um, to some extent, an interest in, in women's interests. And Schröder is, 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 uh, um, is indeed a woman who, on all of these 
reforms has spoken out against them. So women are not unified, women disagree, women come from different political parties, convictions, religions, ideologies. It's very important there's not one, that's what I meant before, it's socially constructed and interests are unclear. Uh, but I think we have a coalescing of various things here that have, these, have made these reforms possible. Does that mean that the conservative welfare state doesn't exist? There's still uh, uh, t tax splitting and there's still other areas in family policy that are costing even more than other f reforms that you have seen that are still, um, still in place and will keep uh, much of the system, I think, also as it was, but we do see um, attempts to move out of the path um, that, that has been uh, uh, forged over the last, uh, last uh, seven decades. And, and I think um, it is partly due to kind of an, a, a changed uh, gender dynamic, and I think also a change in, um, in not just in women, but definitely also in men who are supporting a, a new uh, distribution of work in families who want to be involved, who, who don't want to be responsible 100% Right for uh, uh, family income, all of these things. So have a much different idea of um, how how they think about their lives than maybe their parents or, or, or grandparents um, did, who who built much of that state. So I think you know men and women are changing, and and the reforms are reflecting that. Any other? Last word, or was for these the final word? <laughs> the final word. Thank you. Thank you.